Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Is that working? Can right? Can can the remote uh, people hear me as well? Right. I'm Harry von Rotnitz, professor here in the Faculty of Engineering Built Environment, uh, Chemical Engineering. Uh, I'll do a very brief introduction uh, this evening. Um, it's uh, my colleague, uh, Associate Professor Ni Sifiade, and myself. Uh, it's our pleasure uh, to host uh, from the side of the University of Cape Town, the Environmental Process Systems Engineering Group, uh, the event tonight. Um, Ni and I have uh, predecessors who many of you know. Uh, Ni has taken uh, the position essentially of Duncan Fraser, uh, who was his supervisor. Um, I've uh, t followed in footsteps of Jim Petrie, whom I'll uh, introduce as, as the host for tonight. Um, and, and we run together this uh, research uh, group in environmental and process systems engineering. Uh, and uh, Jim's still with us as an honorary professor and approached us some time ago to say we really need to bring the discussion about energy in this country uh, beyond uh, the eternal electricity crisis and all the, the mishaps that seem to be happening there. Uh, we, we have issues in the liquid fuels that need some debate. So without further ado, I want to hand over to Jim uh, Petrie uh, to introduce the event fully as well as the panelists. Thanks, Har. Can I beg your indulgence and tell me which of these microphones sounds better to you? That one or that one? Okay, we'll stick with this one. Um, firstly, thank you. Given uh, Cape Town's inclement weather, supposedly, uh, I'm very pleased to see as many of you have been able to make it here today. The event was supposed to be opened formally by our Dean of Engineering in the Built Environment, Professor Alison Lewis but um, given the vagaries of the weather system, she's currently indisposed. But it is a great pleasure to firstly be here and to welcome our panelists. Um, I have a couple of presentations, um, and some of the panelists will talk to some slides, but I'd like to give you a kind of running order for the afternoon. Firstly, we will stop solidly or sharply at 7 p.m. because there is a social event that you need to partake of thereafter. Um, but the important thing is that um, we're trialing some software here, uh, which so uh, if, it, if it goes a bit wonky, uh, just I beg your indulgence while we try and get things sorted out. Because this is currently being hosted by the Institution of Chemical Engineers out of the UK. So there are people sitting in Rugby, England, um, who are online managing this for us. Uh, and I'm a technological Luddite, so this is a bit of a challenge for me. So, without further ado, I'd like to give you the running order for this evening. So, th this is part of a global conversation, uh, which the ICME has steered, um, and I will introduce our panelists just now. But the focus here is deliberately to look beyond the immediate challenges for the sector, and to pose some serious questions about where we're going to be in anywhere up to 25 years. So it's definitely strategic, um, and it's hopefully going to ask and answer, as part of a conversation, some of the questions about what that future might look like, given all the imperatives that we're dealing with, the constraints of the existing infrastructure system, both within South Africa and globally. I did say it's part of a global conversation, and I will introduce Steph Simons just now, but Steph will give you the context for where this came and the workshops that have been held preceding this and where we would like to go thereafter. And it's about trying to understand the key constraints that we operate under currently, but to envision a future for this sector, which, as I said, addresses those constraints and looks critically at vital opportunities for the survival of the sector as a whole. So we've got a very illustrious team of presenters here. And I'm going to, they've chosen deliberately not to sit in order as I asked them to, but um, I'm going to ask them now to put up their hands so you can at least put a face to a name. Professor Steph Simons 
who is the chair of the ICME Energy Center, um, and that is an entity that sits within a professional body of some more than 40 odd thousand members in 120 countries. So it really is a critical intellectual cohort of chemical engineers that drives serious debate about a whole host of issues. And within the Energy Center, the future of oil and gas is one of those. Dave Wright. So Dave is the Secretary General of the South African National Energy As As Association, um, which has been a stellar body in stimulating debate about critical issues for the energy sector as a whole. Uh, Sean Johnson. Sean is from the Petroleum Agency of South Africa and is going to share with us some thoughts about the upstream challenges. Niall Kramer. Niall is the CEO of the South African Oil and Gas Alliance, which carries an interesting mandate between upstream and midstream, and there are some serious challenges and opportunities in that space. Kevin Bart, who hopefully is online somewhere, is going to dial in remotely uh, and share with us uh, the view of SAPIA, the South African Petroleum Industry Association, which is a trade association of refiners and off-takers, uh, and again has a very powerful position within the overall value chain of the South African oil and gas sector. Ian Baxter. Um, Ian is an independent person here today. Well, hopefully there are more than one independent people here today, but Ian is going to talk to us as an expert from the refining perspective. Um, and if you challenge him after the forum, he might be able to share a bit more about his background. Rod Crompton, uh, who some of you may know, is the ex nurse regulator for hydrocarbons, now in the academic stroke private consulting space. And he, if you keep your fingers crossed, is going to dial in from Sierra Leone this afternoon, um, pending their sort of internet availability. And our final presenter today is Crave Stain who's from Meridian Economics, and Crevet's company has been instrumental in looking at the whole, uh, I guess, the, the conflicting challenges of business development and regulation across the whole oil and gas space. Um, and hopefully he will share with us some of the exciting developments in that, but also projecting a bit further forward as to um, where we might choose to go. Now this is an area that I'm completely unfamiliar with, but apparently we can tweet from here. Um, so those of you who are active Twitterers or tweeters, there are a number of hashtags that have been developed by iChemi, um, and there are two um, Twitter accounts that you can tweet to, and I'm assured that there are people on the other end of these accounts who are going to retweet them. So hopefully by the end of the evening, Donald Trump will have a very good idea of what we're up to about oil and gas in South Africa. As to the program itself, oh, I was going to welcome uh, uh, Professor Lewis, but I'm actually going to then hand over immediately to Steph, who I said is going to put this in context. We're going to run fairly rapidly through some short, sharp presentations from individuals on our panel. We will then reflect on what we've heard, and I would invite comments from the floor at that point that are points of clarification. Once we've done that, we're going to throw, the, throw it open to the floor and try and shape a conversation, which hopefully we will still have roughly an hour for, uh, that will try and address some of the critical questions that we framed in the invitation that was sent out to you. So without further ado, Steph, it's all yours. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Jim. Um, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, it's an enormous pleasure for me to be here, uh, an honor to be here at the University of Cape Town. Um, I have a lot of connections with this university over the years, but I've never had the chance to come and visit, so I've, I thank Jim for I inviting me, and it's my first visit to South Africa as well, so it's, it's uh, been great. I did bring the, the British summer weather with me, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm glad that uh, you're enjoying that, 
Um, it's exactly the same in the UK at the moment. Trees are coming down, uh, lots, of, lots of rain. It's very windy. My wife told me today it's freezing cold, and that's our summer. So, um, okay. And um, <clears throat> you can tell I'm the, from the UK because I'm wearing a tie. Um, so spot, spot the Brit. Um, great. So uh, I just want to give us a little bit of context of how we got here uh, to this event today. And hopefully we'll only take about 10 minutes. Um, as Jim uh, said, I'm from uh, the Alchemy Energy Centre. That's uh, a, a group that's run by members, as many of the groups are from, from the Alchemy. So it's a voluntary uh, uh, organisation. We put our own uh, private time in, into to running the centre. Uh, my day job is Dean of Engineering, Design and Physical Sciences at Brunel University London, which is in West London. Um, currently doesn't have a chemical engineering department, but I'll have to go ahead to set one up. So I've recruited a few people and we're starting our curriculum design um, where we started that a couple of weeks ago. So we're well on the way to having chemical engineering at Brunel, which would be great. So, so I'm the, the, the chair of the centre, as I said, and the um, centre was launched uh, a couple of years ago in March 2015. Um, it was launched at a, an event that was screened f from uh, at the same time from London, Brisbane, and Kuala Lumpur. And uh, the reason that, for that was that obviously those three countries actually represent the three major areas of the membership of the ICME. Uh, as Jim said, something like 40,000, I think it's around 46,000 members now across the world. And uh, it was set up as a result of a survey that we had of our membership uh, and the members uh, thought that it would be a very good idea that we had a, a body that would provide a coherent voice for chemical engineers worldwide on energy related issues and provide evidence based chemical engineering perspectives on global energy challenges to um, policy decision makers and other stakeholders. So that's that's our remit, and um, there, there you've got all sorts of uh, ways of contacting us. I don't know how to tweet either, so uh, um, I'm a Luddite, as, as like Jim. Um, and out of that survey of the membership, uh, we came up with five priority topics, um, and um, I introduced a sixth one, which is the future of oil and gas, because I felt that... Uh, as chemical engineers, we really have to confront this issue uh, for, uh, primarily, uh, foremost. And um, so the future of oil and gas was, was added to the list, and actually it's been the most successful topic that we've uh, been discussing around the world because it engages so, so many of our members. So many of our members are involved in that industry, and of course chemical engineering came out of, of the petrochemical industry. So. Um, it it's, it's, uh, makes sense that we have that as a priority topic. And the other areas you see here, of course, uh, are uh, understandable, and chemical engineers are involved in all of those. So our objectives are to engage not only with our members, but with other key stakeholders and government bodies in informed debate over the, those priority areas that I've just shown you, um, and to influence um, such people in policy development, energy policy development. And to do this, we've um, established task groups on each of those six areas, uh, headed by members of the Energy Centre Board, and Jim is a, a member of that of the board, um, which is a worldwide uh, board, and um, produce green and white papers uh, on, on uh, these various aspects. But of course, um, although the ICME's headquarters are in the UK, we are an international body and we need to make sure that we speak and have a voice internationally and we need to recognise the regional as well as global perspectives and this is why this event is, is so important to us um, because we recognise that uh, different regions have different views on, on all of these areas. So to have a voice, we need to stand up and, and be heard, of course, and this is an example of a, a press release 
that I'm very proud actually of the ICME because we, we, we actually were ready for, for Trump and uh, uh, we were one of the first to come out with our press release. Um, this is just a screenshot of, of the uh, ICME website where you can find the, the statement that I made on behalf of the Energy Centre, there's only part of it here, um, and that got quite a lot of media attention actually. So um, that's the kind of thing that we, we like to do, to be ready for, for those kind of um, major announcements that uh, come up now and again. And we also were involved actually with COP21. Um, I don't know if any of you have been, I know Harold has, but uh, to these uh, COP meetings, but um, apart from the central negotiations, you have a whole series of side events going on. And um, at COP21, we had um, what was regarded as one of the most successful side events. We had 300 people, standing room only, coming to uh, see presentations by engineers talking about the technology um, solutions that are out there to mitigate climate change. And the comments that we were getting were that, was that there was not enough discussion at COP21 about how we can actually achieve um, emission reductions and climate change mitigation. So we published um, uh, this report in the TCE, the, the Chemical Engineer, after the event, of course, and you, and, um, you probably can't read, read that now because it's quite small text, but it, it basically says that we feel as chemical engineers that we, we have the technologies available to us now to, to um, work towards the two degree or one and a half degree target um, but uh, what we need is a systems approach and, uh, and we need to start implementing right now. And, and you can see one of these um, uh, subtitles actually talks about the future of oil and gas because uh, we talked about that at COP21 as well in the context of climate change. So uh, to, to bring us back to the future of oil and gas, we've set out to formulate a considered view um, of the future of oil and gas in the global energy mix and we're doing that by um, having um, uh, this, this series of panel debates across the world on the future of oil and gas and out of that we're going to, re to develop a report uh, really highlighting the regional differences and, and similarities actually that the industry faces. And as I said, we've set up a task group to uh, help us uh, do that, which is um, headed by one of our board members. Um, and why do we think it's important? Well, there's some obvious things, of course, with the, the collapse in the oil price um, and uh, the failure of it to recover has, has actually caused quite a, a shock around the world, not only in the industry itself, but also uh, in those economies that really depend on oil and gas. Um, and this is, has led to questions being asked and the business models of big oil being, being challenged. But we know, of course, that demand increases, continues to increase for, for all sorts of resources. And we have climate change policies and green investment and changes in behavior. And these are beginning to, to have an impact on oil and gas, well, particularly oil consumption. Um, and of course, as chemical engineers, as most of us are in this room, um, oil and gas are major fuels for the chemical industry. So we need to start thinking about what that will mean for our industry going forward, uh, not only in, in terms of, of um, uh, the importance of oil and gas in, in petrochemicals and everything else, but also the impact of climate change. And um, when we look at particularly oil and oil consumption uh, globally, um, it's not a surprise to see that it's um, transport that takes up the majority of oil products um, uh, with a, a, quite a small percentage actually being used for electricity generation. Um, uh, globally, I think it's the average is around 5%, but I, I know in South Africa and Sub-Saharan um, Africa, that's, it's slightly higher than that. Um, and of course, a sizable amount of oil used in the, in the chemical industry, as, as we said. When we look at gas, of course, gas uh, is used much more in, in uh, electricity production and is, is growing in that sector uh, and is seen as the 
transition fuel of choice uh, to move to a low carbon economy. Um, but that being said, even with global decline in, in consumption of oil, it's still, it's still the number one energy source um, and um, it, uh, it's, it's lost ground in terms of um, uh, the use of oil in, in producing um, electricity. Uh, gas has really taken that away from oil. But of course, with the transport sector being so huge, um, it really has, and, and together with the, with the petrochem, you can see that it's still a very dominant and will be a very dominant um, fuel source for years to come. And just focusing a little bit on the, the, the transport sector um, and the use of fuels, this, this uh, picture here uh, from the IEA shows for different regions of the world um, how oil is, is well, how, what fuels are used in, in transport and you can see uh, that um, those that are derived from oil make up the majority of the, of the uh, fuels in transport. Uh, including in Africa, as you can see there, and not surprisingly, most of that is used in, in cars, in, in, in petroleum or gasoline. Um, diesel takes up a big chunk. Um, diesel is now under attack quite a lot in Europe. Uh, the UK um, is uh, focused on phasing out diesel engines, um, making diesel fuel very expensive and uh, making it quite quite difficult to actually um, buy diesel cars. So, um, so we'll see that uh, shrinking somewhat and that's going to be interesting. I wonder what's uh, going to come out of this conversation here today. So something like 93% of oil products, um, uh, oil products share of the final energy consumption for transport, making the sector the, uh, the least diversified. Uh, but you can see the impact, um, the growth of that sector on CO2 emissions. So it's something that we need to discuss. Uh, and then um, uh, just thinking about climate change, uh, when we talk about uh, the Paris Agreement and its target of, well, the target's one and a, well below two, two degrees, but that's uh, recognized as being very challenging to get to. So a two degree target would mean that we, we have very much less than half our, our carbon budget left um, before we, we tip over that point. So um, that's something else that we need to consider when we're talking about using of, use of fossil fuels. And um, this is a summary slide of a paper that came out of my former institution, uh, University College London, uh, just a few years ago now, which was published in Nature magazine. And um, it's, it's the result of modeling, which gives you the least cost optimization uh, of um, of, of obtaining that two degree uh, target and, and then shows us how much of the remaining reserves of coal, oil and gas should stay underground, should stay in the ground um, to be able to reach that target. And you can see for Africa in that model, 90% uh, of coal should remain where it is. 34% um, of, of gas and 26% and of the oil reserves, 26% of the oil reserves of Africa should actually remain underground um, if we're going to reach the uh, two degree warming. Now, of course, this is all, all modeling, but it, it does give us uh, some uh, food for thought in terms of the impact of the oil and gas industry. So uh, where are we so far with the oil and gas story? Uh, we've had workshops um, all over the world. We've had a, uh, a few in Australia. We've had a couple in Malaysia that I attended, one in New Zealand, one in Qatar, uh, which, is, which is obviously in the news at the moment, and across, of course, across the UK, um, not only in the south of the country, um, but also obviously in the oil-producing parts up, up north. And, and um, we've also had these as standalone workshops like this, but we've also been involved in major conferences like Chemica, and there's one upcoming actually in Singapore with the World Engineering Summit, where, we've, where I'm also going to be attending as a panel member. And we've been asking the same 10 questions of everybody, and they're not in any particular order, although we have asked our panel here to consider what priorities are for South Africa. 
Um, and so these are the kind of things that we would like you to think about today and help us with in our debate. And um, it's, it's not surprising that they, the answers we get are very regional. So for instance, with the first question here, is the oil and gas industry in decline? Well, the answer might be yes in the UK, but I'm sure here the answer will probably be no. Um, but you know, there's, there is consideration about the kind of business models you need to look at in the future. Um, what's going to be the impact of electrification of 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 transport? Um, and um, uh, should there be major investment in the chemical industry, the petrochemical industry, for instance? So. Um, I'd like you to um, obviously help us today with these kind of questions and I'm sure the panelists are going to address some of these themselves and um, if you'd like to be part of the Energy Centre then please uh, email us um, because we, we have two fora. One is we call the Leadership Forum which is for energy experts to help us with our priority tasks and we also have a, um, a future energy leaders for which is for all the students and the, those young engineers that have graduated and, and finding themselves in the in the energy related industry okay so I hope that wasn't two or oh, 15 minutes okay so thanks very much and um, enjoy the rest of the event and thank you, Steph. Uh, I would like to point out one uh, error in his presentation. We are not dominated by chemical engineers here this evening, um, which I find quite gratifying. Um, but it is important to understand that this is a conversation which has to be as inclusive of as diverse a set of stakeholder inputs as possible. And a country like South Africa and its energy challenges manifests that complexity of views very strikingly. So one of the reasons that I put up my hand to help drive this was specifically because of that, to ensure that we could capture a diversity of stakeholder views. So I hope you don't feel intimidated if you're not an engineer, that you will ask pointed questions, and between the rest of us and the panel, hopefully we can provide some perspective that will be valuable to you. So I'd like to move on and invite Dave Wright from Sania to come and join us. And with a bit of luck. There we go. Dave, over to you. Down here. There you go. Thanks, Jim. Thank and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to um, start my presentation by looking at the uh, recently published World Energy Council scenarios that they put out in October 2016. Um, uh, before getting into the detail of, of those, just to recognize that um, whilst the World Energy Council put them all together, the number crunching and modeling was done by the poor Sherry Institute in Switzerland uh, and Accenture Strategy Analysis also helped with the whole process. The three scenarios that uh, World Energy Council have come up with are, are essentially modern jazz, unfinished symphony and hard rock. Um, and the critical features of modern jazz is that it's the market that drives the process. Unfinished symphony it's really policy driven or state or government driven and hard rock is quite frankly a mess. Um, so what I'm going to show you tonight are the um, uh, various uh, hydrocarbon profiles which emerge uh, as a consequence of the assumptions made um, in setting up these scenarios. Remembering, of course, that scenarios are only uh, a possible view, a possible future that we may or may not experience. So going straight to uh, coal, oil and gas, and I included oil, I included coal here um, because coal is a very important part of the oil and gas game in South Africa. And you can see that the um, uh, coal demand uh, peaks uh, quite, quite early in the game and diminishes with, um, with uh, modern jazz and unfinished symphony, but it sort of Trottles, trottles along as business as usual, as it were, um, in, in the uh, hard rock uh, setup. 
From an oil demand perspective, you'll see that the peak occurs around about 2030 for both the uh, um, uh, modern jazz and, and unfinished symphony, um, whereas um, the hard rock um, plateaus. Um, in, the, in all three scenarios, the gas profile is just onwards and upwards. So um, that's the global picture. And um, the, the, the question is to ask, um, what does that look like for something close to home? And um, unfortunately, the scenarios haven't been done for South Africa, but they have been done for uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And you can see that the profiles are very different uh, for Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, you can see that the coal uh, demand is, is quite different. You see that the unfinished symphony one drives down the coal demand, whereas um, modern jazz, which is market-driven, pushes it up, and uh, hard rock also pushes it up. But the oil and gas profiles are both upwards and onwards for all of the scenarios, which suggests then, or begs the question, I think, you know, where then for South Africa uh, will we will our futures potentially look like? Just as a, an aside, um, given the, the focus on the two degrees issue, the modeling uh, shows that none of the scenarios actually allow uh, or will achieve the two, two degree option. Uh, the dotted line is the two degree target, um, and that's for the globe, um, and that's what the emissions would do for, for, Afri for Sub Saharan Africa. Um, and those, that profile that you're seeing there shouldn't surprise you if you looked at the profile of the use of the hydrocarbons uh, in the scenarios. So I'd like to just end um, my discussion on the scenarios at that point and, and stand back and say, well, what does this mean for South Africa? Um, and, and like so many things in South Africa, I suggest it's going to be a combination of the two. I think we're going to see some of the uh, trajectory that we see on a global basis, and we're going to see uh, the, the some of the trajectory that we're seeing or anticipating for Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I think that um, the, the oil demand will go through a peak, whether it's at 2030 or whether it's later. I suspect it will be later. Um, and what I suggest what's going to drive that is the uh, the penetration of electric vehicles, um, and how quickly we get electric vehicles into the system uh, will, I think, affect the, 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 the oil demand side of things. We must always say, take into account that the average age of vehicles in South Africa is actually quite long. It's like 11 to 13 years. So the, the transformation process won't happen instantaneously. It will take time. Um, the question that then arises in my mind is, what do we do with the existing refineries, and do we need a new one? Um, if the decrease in demand on a global basis is um, is greater than it is in sub-Saharan Africa, then um, the question for me that arises is, will sub-Saharan Africa and South Africa become a focus area for selling oil? Uh, if we are still dem we have a greater demand for oil, are we going to be an attractive market for people who have crude oil? So will that mean that crude oil producers will want to buy our refineries or will they want to put up refineries here? I don't know, but I think we need to, th to think about that. Um, the, the other thing that comes into the game here is what's happening to the African crude refiners, if, uh, crude producers. If they want to stay in business, they, they should really try and get their crude sold in Southern Africa, sub-Saharan Africa and look to sell a crude in South Africa because the, the rest of their market is collapsing uh, around them. And I, Look, I'm talking in the 20, 30 plus years time. So I'm, I'm not talking tomorrow. If you look at the, 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 the short term stuff, it's all onwards and upwards up to a point. But if we, and we all know that the, the transition process in these industries takes time. And we need to start thinking about that. So questions that we've talked about what the impact might be on the refineries, if we get a whole fleet of electric vehicles into the system, the question then begins to ask what's happening to the retail industry. Um, so I think there's quite a lot of thinking that needs to be or should be happening within the, the oil industry right now about what's going to happen. I doubt that we'll see any more new coal to liquid plants because they're both too expensive and uh, they have the CO2 effect. 
And that then, to me, begs the question, what impact is that going to have on our pet chem industry? Because if you look at our petroleum, uh, petrochemical industry in South Africa, it's essentially coal-based. So are we not going to have a pet chem industry in 20 or 30 years' time? I hope not. Uh, that has a significant impact on all sorts of features of, of, of the South African setup. From a gas point of view, um, clearly gas is going to play a very much more important role. Unfortunately, we don't seem to have a resource of our own at the moment in the country. Um, if we get a resource, uh, I think it'll be even better. But you can see the profiles, whether it's global or whether it's um, sub-Saharan Africa, it's all upwards and onwards. So, um, yeah, I think the situation is where um, on the gas side it looks good. On the oil side, I think we've got to be thinking quite carefully about what we're going to do. And I think it has um, some significant impacts on the, the, the pet chem side that need to start being thought about. Thanks. Thank you, Dave. Um, just bear with me for 30 seconds. I have to change a slide setup here. But in the interim, can we invite Sean to come up and talk from a Petroleum Agency of South Africa perspective? Hi, good evening, everybody. I'm Sean. Jim, thank you very much for this opportunity um, to be talking about exploration in South Africa. Um, I was going to talk this off the top of my head, but I thought that it wouldn't make sense to some of you or many of you who don't actually know what is happening in South Africa, both on and offshore. Um, so here's a map. Um, this is a, a popular map. You can get this off the Petroleum Agency's website, should you be interested and it shows quite a lot of information. Um, I want to start by talking about the offshore. Uh, does someone have a... Do you have a... No stick. I'll try using the mouse. So what we see in the offshore here is all these red lines indicate uh, seismic surveys that have been shot. Um, and this has been done since, um, since about the mid-60s, late-60s all the way through to the 90s and then more recently in the last five to ten years we've had new technologies and and also seismic um, to understand the deeper parts of um, our continental margin. So in the older days in Suko most of the data focused on on the continental shelf um, <clears throat> that has now progressively moved on to, to the deeper areas. Um, we've got about over 220,000 line kilometers of seismic data there, and we've got a very um, specialized team of geoscientists working on that. So the question I would like to start off um, is then what do we already know in terms of data? Where are we now? Um, <clears throat> we've also got um, a number of wells that were drilled on the west coast. There are about 40 wells that were drilled in Sikos days, also between the 70s and the 90s. And there's been success in terms of uh, discovery of oil in the AJ Graven. Uh, this is near the shore. And then also most of you will be familiar with the Ibubisi gas field. And there's also the Kudu gas field just north of South Africa in Namibia. In the south coast, the very popular FA gas field, which is now depleted, uh, that platform operated for approximately 20 years of just less than 1 trillion cubic feet of gas. Um, 
We've also got four well drilled on the East Coast. Um, nothing major at this time, but as you can see, there's a vast amount of interest in that 100% of South Africa's offshore is now either licensed for exploration or it's under application. <clears throat> so some of you would also know that in the media, you see South Africa has low oil potential, low gas potential. Um, but this tells us that that is not necessarily correct. From all of this data, what we do know is that there are active petroleum systems on South Africa's western margin, definitely on the southern margin, and potentially on the eastern margin. And this is where the concentration is focused at this point in time, on the eastern margin. Um, moving to the onshore, uh, everybody would know about shale gas applications that was made by Shell in late 2009. Um, what do we know? Um, the data, the seismic data that was acquired there is actually very poor. Uh, it cannot be used for identifying prospects or, or, or any reservoir uh, level work. Uh, but it does give us a big picture and understanding of the regional geology and that's about the limits of that. Suko drilled about 40 wells into Kuru. Um, at that time, Suko focused on oil. So that wasn't gas. And the data they acquired doesn't really help us a lot understanding shale gas potential. What it does tell us is it tells us about the gas generation potential or oil generation potential. So we know what the generation potential is. We've got a very mature source up there. Um, but we don't yet understand uh, the preservation for gas in the shale. So that is where we are at the moment. Um, in the northern, northeastern part of the country, everybody knows that these are all the coal fields. Uh, there's a, a, a lot of interest for, for coal bed methane. In fact, a number of discoveries have been made. Um, most of you will be familiar with uh, the Waterberg, now called the Lipalali Play. Um, that is operated by Anglo Thermal Coal. They've been running five spot tests there since about 2004 and um, they were flowing gas for about 10 years or so. But uh, through the environmental constraints and regulatory issues, they were forced to stop. Um, we know that there are discoveries uh, from recent exploration done in the Mopani, Mopani area. Um, we also know that they are recently, and you can verify this on the Kinetico website, uh, they've publicized their, their exploration results. Uh, they've discovered what we call a hybrid play. They've discovered gas in both sands and in the coal. So we know um, there's definitely potential there, and they've actually disclosed contingent resources. <clears throat> as far as the remainder of the crew is concerned, um, historically, and the Petroleum Agency is busy at this point in time in putting together a very reasonable map of showing all the oil and gas shows that we have across South Africa. And this, um, this compilation will include records from the late 1800s that we've been able to discover and uncover, as well as um, a lot of the information you're seeing here and also the recent discoveries. So what are the challenges? Um, from an oil and gas point of view, I, I want to move to the next question in trying to answer that by saying the following. Um, I was asked what is the realistic time frame from petroleum agency perspective for both on and offshore exploration, giving the assumptions that the regulatory the regulations are cleared out. I'd like to answer this by saying that that would depend on industry's response. Now for, for those who are economists, oil and gas, uh, energy economists, would know that the two key players in oil and gas, in the oil and gas business, are the government and the private operator. And a private company uh, would have the objectives of making profit, whereas the government would have the objectives of mm -hmm extracting revenue 
from 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 the mining of the resources in order to improve the the well-being of the citizens but what needs to happen is that there needs to be a partnership if there is no partnership <clears throat> there won't be a balance and exploration and production won't happen so from the challenges that we're facing now is they are both technical challenges but they are also higher level challenges that we're dealing with um, if I may just one more there's been a lot of comp there's been a lot of debate about hydraulic fracturing in the Karoo and I don't want to go into that conversation in too much detail because it's not my area of specialization but what I can say this is that currently the exploration right is three years and it's renewable for three times for two years so that's a total of nine years in which an oil and gas company can undertake exploration given the cost of horizontal drilling given the cost and the challenges for fracking it is most likely that the fracking part won't take place anywhere early in the exploration life cycle and this is where this is where people need to understand what is meant by the field life cycle. There are a number of phases that oil and gas exploration projects go through. The one is firstly securing a right. That is negotiating with government, meeting the conditions. The second part would be assessing that, the feasibility. Assessing the feasibility includes understanding the preservation for gas. If there is, if we cannot prove the preservation of gas exploration will not go ahead. So, as part of all the challenges and uncertainties, uh, that is where I'd like to leave it. <laughs> and I'll take any questions that come on. Thank you, Jim. Cheers. Thank you, Sean. As I said, I'd like to keep general discussion questions till after we've heard from all the panelists. But I think it was important to reflect very quickly on where we are in terms of the regulatory systems and government policy and the aspirations that we're hearing from the commercial sector and how one unf unfolds or rather enfolds all of that into a serious conversation about long-term sustainability futures. And with that, Niall, would you care to share your views with us, please? Thanks, Jim. Um, good evening, everybody. I'm Niall Kramer from the South African Oil and Gas Alliance. Um, so obviously, we do. We, I mean, we have nothing to do with coal, but we represent oil and gas. We have a membership of some 280 odd companies and a very large database that we can influence through. And I describe what we do as two things: we're an interpretation agency and a dating agency, and we interpret policy in between the two um, groups that Sean was referring to, between government and private uh, investing businesses or potentially investing businesses and try to, 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 to navigate that gap so people can understand each other and come to uh, a sensible policy and then as a dating agency trying to link business, primarily our members, up to the kind of opportunities that we see on the map here. So the end game for us is an attractive investable oil and gas environment. So we want the explorers to come. We want uh, the LNG importers to come. So we do a lot of our work through committees and we have so if, uh, what Sean's been talking about here on the onshore, on fracking, we have all the companies that want to frack uh, and explore for shale gas in the Karoo our members, then typically we would have services companies, oil field services, general services through engineering, right through to companies that might make um, safety boots. Uh, so it's a very broad value chain that we represent. The, um, in, in thinking through what I was going to say here, um, there are a couple of things that came to mind. And, and my thoughts are not the long, the 20, 
25 years that Jim was asking us to think about. Mine are really around the, the, the much shorter period. And I think that 2017, to me, seems like a really big year for South African oil and gas. And there were a couple of things on the horizon. There was a conference last week at which uh, the new Minister of Energy, I think she might have been there for five weeks or something, um, her DG, her Director General, various officials, and then very importantly, the IPP office, the independent <coughs> um, uh, power producers, were all represented on one stage speaking with one policy voice. And basically that was saying that LNG to power, which is probably the next big step in terms of oil and gas in our world, is going to happen and it is imminent. Um, and I have every reason to believe that. It's been on the cards for so long. The IPP office is a very credible outfit. They ran the renewables program. Um, through, I think it was four rounds of bidding, drove the prices down. Uh, people were very uh, happy with that process, but not happy with the outcome and ESCOM's not signing of the agreements. That's a separate matter. Um, but it's, it's a body that we feel comfortable will run a good process. So we're hopeful that that will happen as stated. There have been hiccups on that program. Uh, it was announced in October of last year, and then the uh, the RFQ uh, was due to come out imminently after that. It didn't, and it's still we're still waiting for it. We're told it will come now. There were some other issues that came into play there. And then the other one, which is the really big one for us, is the MPRDA, the Mining Petroleum Resource Development Act amendments. Now, just before the last election, uh, this was pushed through the National Assembly and due for signature after the election, the president did not sign it, and the new mining minister at that point asked, apparently asked him to hold back. Well, he's still holding back. It has not yet been signed, and that's a key piece for us because the investing companies, the explorers, simply cannot go ahead and explore without the legal clarity, the legal framework under which it operates. They need uh, clarity, they need stability, they need commercially attractive terms. Um, and without that, I, in my view, I think that is a big worry. Now, we are told this is imminent. I hope that that is true. So LNG and the MPRDA, in my view, are the two really important building blocks that, <laughs> should they come through this year, then we have potentially something that the country can build on. These are huge, huge projects, especially the LNG to power one. Um, and it's an opportunity for South Africa to showcase to the world that we can do really big projects. So we've done three, what is it, a cricket, a rugby, a football World Cup, things like the car train. And there are, there are a number of projects out there that we've done really, really well when we have the political will and the country behind them. Obviously, I mean, it doesn't take long to look at some projects like Madupi and Kasili that haven't um, been uh, huge successes or stuck to timelines and budgets. But with these things in place, we, there's an opportunity to showcase that we're on a trajectory that I, I like to characterize it as one of two routes. Obviously, there's an infinite variety between them. But if we get big projects and we find that there is oil and gas, and we underpin that with good policy, good discipline, and hopefully a sovereign fund, then we have potentially the Norway route. Um, if we don't do that and we have poor policy, poor discipline, you just, I mean, there are any number of countries that you can look at that, um, you know, are not shining examples of what I believe our future should be like Venezuela. Um, so that's to that that's a little bit about the background. I think that there are are you walking towards me because I must hurry up or oh, all right. I've I've got four things that I wanted to touch on. Um and in view of Jim's uh, shuffling around behind me, I'm gonna start at the end. Uh and and that was that uh, the thing I think we need most is a shared concrete 
vision of what the future could be for oil and gas in South Africa. And we have a, a multiplicity of government departments, many different policies. Uh, somebody raised with me, you know, where is GUMP at the moment, the, the gas master plan. Um, and we need more unity, a more concrete vision of what that future could be in oil and gas. And it's very, I find it really difficult to create that vision because we don't come from an oil and gas jurisdiction. We have not had in South Africa oil and gas. So we have lots of anecdotes, lots of pictures on Facebook and so on, but we don't have this, the, we, we don't look around us and see activity or uh, we're not all aware of, for example, how gas can be used. Um, the other things I wanted to touch on was capacity development. And that's this whole issue of are we in fact ready for an oil and gas economy? And the kind of skills that we are going to need, the kind of business readiness to participate in that value chain clearly needs a lot of work. We do uh, quite a bit of that work in skills development, mainly uh, blue collar people, artisan development, technician development. Um, but the kind of jump that we're going to need in the real skills when an oil and gas economy comes along is going to be quite serious. It's a, it'll be a big, big jump, as will the necessity for focus on discipline, especially around health and safety. The safety issues on an oil rig or in an oil uh, or a gas rig are, in, from what I've seen, way in excess of what we currently are able to exhibit in South Africa. So um, the reason I asked for this map to be left up here was I, f I find it quite an inspiring picture because if you look beyond uh, up the west coast there, all of these markets, Equatorial Guinea, Gabon, Angola, Nigeria, all with proven oil reserves. If you go up the east coast, Tanzania, Mozambique, uh, Kenya, Uganda, uh, certainly in the, in the Mozambique, Tanzania case, some of the biggest gas finds in history up there. Now, all of this uh, acreage around the coast and onshore that's demarcated by these blocks has been, it's under interest of some kind by commercial operators. And it's critical that we get the MPRDA over the line in attractive, stable terms so that people could take an interest and actually get out there and do some exploration. Yes, the price is an issue. Um, it has, it's trending up over, what was last year, 2016? Yeah, uh, from January to January, the price went up steadily over 50%. It's hovering around 50. It's been toying with $55 a barrel at the moment. Um, so let's assume that goes up. We get the MPRDA, the, 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 the reputable explorers come in. That is what is going to cause the economic growth, create the wherewithal that could be spread across the economy. Um, uh, sorry, across the population. The, the other piece in that is the importation of LNG through the three ports that have been named are up on the far, uh, your right-hand side, Richards Bay, down here to Kucha, near Port Elizabeth, and then Sildana Bay, somewhere over here. Um, and the key piece for that, in our thinking, is that it brings in liquid natural gas. It drives large-scale developments, especially around the ports, uh, and that kickstarts a gas economy. If, uh, as Sean is saying, nine years down the line, we find some uh, indigenous gas, whether it's offshore or onshore, then we have a feedstock that an indigenous gas economy could run off that's no longer uh, dollar exposed. So I'm, I'm starting to feel somebody shuffling around behind me, so I think I'm going to stop over here. Jim, thank you. Cheers. Now we're going to try something different, and I'm hoping Kevin is on the other end of the line somewhere. Kevin, can you hear us? <coughs> yes, I can. I Fantastic. And, and we can hear you here. So without further ado, Kevin Bart, who's Head of Strategic Projects for SAPIA, will share with us his view on 
sector challenges and hopefully the medium term future from the perspective. Oh, oh, uh, Kevin, it's over to you. Uh, thank you, Jim. Um, in terms of, let's say, the short term to the medium term, uh, apart from the transformation imperatives imposed upon us by government, uh, the major issues which we see are really uh, carbon tax and the carbon budget, uh, the one under the control of National Treasury and the one under the control of the Department of Environmental Affairs. Um, the other one is the implementation of Clean Fields 2, uh, when that will happen. And, uh, and it's not an if it will happen, it's, a, it's rather when that will happen. And the other big issue, which is uh, which uh, we are tending to focus quite a lot on now, is the implementation of MARPOL Annex 6 in 2020. Uh, now, MARPOL Annex 6 is actually a the implementation of a sulfur cap on all bunker fuels of 0.5% uh, by weight. Uh, that is set to actually have major implications for the refining industry worldwide. Um, those really are the, are the three big issues which are which are affecting us in the short short term. Um, National Treasury has published a carbon tax bill, and we are in discussions with them around various aspects related to that. Uh, the DEA is doing their carbon budgets, and they publish greenhouse gas regulations, uh, which mandate that. Um, Certain classified emitters above a particular threshold need to need to register as greenhouse gas emitters, and then obviously provide uh, greenhouse gas um, emissions on an annual basis. <clears throat> now, that's really the short term. The thing with with clean fuels, uh, as many of you probably know, uh, clean fuels two is or was meant to be implemented on 1 July 2017. Uh, however, there is a dispute in a way with the Department of Energy as to how this, this whole project will be financed, uh, such that the local refining industry will not be ready by 1 July 2017. And we've requested the minister, and she has agreed to actually rescind the regulations, which are in place at this stage in time. And we are waiting with bated breath as to when that will, will be gazetted. Uh, hopefully, it will be within the next few weeks. But on clean fuels, it is, it's not, as I said, it's not a when, it's not an if it will happen, it's a when it will happen. It's rather interesting to note that at this stage in time, the demand for 95 octane fuel in the country, um, South Africa, as many of you know, is, uh, is a dual octane country, so to speak, uh, with generally a 93 octane uh, suitable in the inland region of the high felt and the 95 octane at the coast. But what has happened over the years is that um, uh, the 95 has actually increased to a level which is now roughly about 70% of the total gasoline demand in the country. Uh, with regards to uh, diesel, it is also interesting in that the, uh, the demand for low sulfur, uh, 50 ppm in, in this country, not 10 ppm uh, in the OEC, OECD, is um, is now roughly sitting at 55% of total diesel demand. So the market is in fact uh, catching up with us, and for the refining industry, the refining industry will need to actually address that issue, um, with or without a financial compensation uh, to the industry to implement clean fuels. It is happening. And talking about that and getting back to some of Dave's issues with regards the the uh, new, a potential new refinery or using South Africa as, let's not say a dumping, but um, using uh, excess product produced elsewhere and that being imported into the country. Uh, we conducted an economic uh, impact assessment and we found that the local refining industry, or in fact the local oil industry, uh, that is midstream, downstream refining, uh, distribution, retail, uh, contributed to about something like 700,000 jobs uh, that's direct, indirect, and induced, uh, which is which is quite interesting in terms of the economic impact we have in have in this country, and that is also supported by Woodmax studies, which suggest that um, in Africa as a whole, uh, 
even having a very small refinery of let's say roughly 30, 30 35,000 barrels a day uh, has a significant economic impact on the country. And it's quite important that, that we realize this and we in fact try to protect the industry. I'm not saying protectionism, I'm saying we protect and foster the industry. And getting back to Dave's comments, also probably look at expanding into uh, into supplying feedstocks for for uh, local chemicals. So, so those really are the are the short term challenges. But it's the main thing to actually which we see for the longer term is really how to how to meet the demands for. Uh, long-term energy supply to the majority of the people. Now, IPICA did a quite an interesting presentation related to this, where they estimate, they calculate, and determined that currently the current energy system uh, supplies about 570 hectajoules to a population of, to a global population of 6.2 billion, and the real challenge is to supply about a thousand hectajoules to a population of 10 billion people uh, worldwide using modern energy and meeting the climate challenges which, uh, which affect us all. And the, and the major way in that, in that, in how that will be achieved, and this gets back to one of the questions posed, posed by the prof on the importance of chemical engineers, is in fact improving e efficiency. Uh, in order to save energy and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And it's that improvement of efficiency which will in fact uh, allow us to actually use energy more efficiently and make us all benefit. That's all I've got to say for this, at this stage in time. Thank you, Ke oh, excuse me. Thank you Kevin, for that. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to stay online in case we've got some questions for you a bit later. That's um, no problem. All right. Ian, could you join us then and continue the conversation about the refining perspective, please? Thank you, Jim. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, good evening, Kevin. Um, I'm going to be talking about the refining industry. The Minister has recently reminded us of the fact that over the last few years, imports of fuel have risen. Uh, and this reopened the discussion of Project Tombo. This was intended to be a new, large, high conversion refinery, first mooted by Petro SA a decade or so ago, um, to meet the local production shortfall as well as servicing other sub Saharan African countries. New large projects are always exciting ventures to contemplate, and of course they, they employ chemical engineers, um, but they are expensive. Could we not perhaps deliver some of that additional capacity from the existing refineries? South Africa's coastal refineries may not be the youngest ones uh, in the world, but they are basically sound. They have, however, suffered from ongoing underinvestment for many decades. They were built as low conversion, cracking, reforming refineries, um, from which about 70% of the crude becomes high value products. As fuel demand has risen, the country has chosen to import the shortfall rather than to invest to deliver more fuel from the same volume of crude. Now, how can this state of affairs arise? Refining capacity globally has outpaced fuel demand, meaning that high quality fuels are available from many geographically and politically diverse sources at competitive prices. Locally, the vertical fragmentation of the oil industry over the last two decades has led to an ever increasing number of independent importing wholesalers who import without having any obligation to outlet capital on refining or logistics capital, capacity rather. There is, in addition, no obligation on importing wholesalers to be sustainable or to try and source product from a local oil refiner. There are thus no long-term contracts in place which might support investment in higher conversion or additional refining capacity. And this has arisen basically from policy lassitude. There is not, and hasn't been for decades, any articulated strategy or policy linking refinery investment to government energy, employment, 
or foreign exchange objectives. Fuels manufacture is not the only place where absent or misaligned policies, strategies, or regulations undermine investment in the fuel sector. Viewed from a macroeconomic perspective, the investment in new refineries, greenfield, what the engineers would call a greenfield refinery, Project in Tombo was intended to be one, um, is likely only to deliver an acceptable return to its investors if it's necessary to add value to low value or captive crude, or if there's sufficient local fuel demand to justify large capacity, if there's a geographical advantage driving product prices, or if there's vertical integration into petrochemicals. And typically most investment has fallen into one of those four categories over the last uh, couple of decades. In most other cases, and this is a debatable point, over the lifetime of a, ref of a refinery, it delivers no net return. It's a necessary evil to turn unsaleable crude into merchantable high quality products. But used refineries, brownfield operations, which employ more engineers than greenfield ones do, are a different matter. The current coastal refineries probably have a low book value. Some have been around for 60 years, some less than that. Re-establishing the original asset value by making brownfield investments to upgrade low value products, such as marine fuel oil, may be expensive, but are technically straightforward, and the higher value products produced can deliver an acceptable return on investment by displacing fuel imports. Such projects can simultaneously deliver the clean fuels demanded by NAMSA and increasingly the fuels marketplace. Uh, Kevin told us just now the CF2 deadline. CF2 is due in 23 days from now, and Marpol is due in 933 days from now. And not many engineers are going to build a plant in 900 days to turn fuel oil into high value products. We've heard occasionally in the past about old refiners, but we've also heard about skills shortages. Um, the industry trains artisans, operators, technicians, and engineers on an ongoing basis. But we've got to remember that these skills are internationally marketable. And with free mobility of labor, uh, we can train people up. But if we don't pay them the right money or give them the right T's and C's to stay here, then they'll go and find a job somewhere else in the world that pays well. Later on, I'll pick up questions afterwards. Thanks, Jim. So without anticipating the conversation, and we are going to lead to that very soon, there is this continual specter in the back of all of the presentations we've heard thus far about coherence of policy, whether it's short-term focus, whether it's long-term visioning, whether it's aligned across the full policy spectrum from minerals to energy to environment. So I, I would ask you to bear that in mind when you reflect on the sorts of questions that you're keen to ask. We're going to try one more dial-in speaker. Rod, are you there? Uh, I should say, Rod Crompton sitting in Sierra Leone today. Um, and we did know that there could be a problem with him being able to join us. So I think we will move straight on to our final speaker from the panel. And then we're going to throw the floor open with some facilitated uh, discussion. So, Crave Stein, over to you. That's better. Thank you, Jim. Um, there's been a lot of detailed input, which um, I probably won't re repeat. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll focus my comments perhaps on the slightly longer term questions and take a risk of doing some long term um, kind of gazing, which is, as I understand, the, the, the interest or the focus of the discussion today. So looking at liquid fuels and thinking about what are the potential drivers that could change the industry as time goes on, and I'm talking firstly about liquid fuels and then about gas. The first, uh, I think, interesting um, driver for me is that demand, the total demand for liquid fuels, as far as I understand, is actually quite stable. It doesn't, it's not really growing very much. And that's the same, same with electricity for, for um, slightly different reasons. However, demand for 
clean fuels is, is growing, as we've already heard this evening. Um, and that demand, particularly the demand for clean fuels, is driving the demand for, for, for more inputs. Um, and that's, that's definitely behind the uh, 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 important part behind the growth in imports. Further, as far as I can see, there really is no economic case for building an additional refinery. It's, uh, it's just not going to work. We can't compete with the large global refineries. And as we've already heard this evening, high quality final refined product is, is available uh, in all, all, all over the world and is likely to be so for, for, for the foreseeable future. Also, as we've already heard, um, existing refineries are very hesitant to reinvest and also even to reinvest in the clean fuels requirements uh, in the current regulatory regime. Um, so overall, all of this points to a greater role for, for imports, even in a scenario where demand is quite stagnant. And ultimately, for me, that means a need for investment in more important storage infrastructure. So in a, in a, in a world that I live in, that is uh, an important conclusion of, for the medium to longer term trend in the industry. We're not going to see a lot of new refine. We're not going to see new refinery capacity. That's un unlikely, and increasingly the focus is going to be on on greater import cap capacity. That's that's my my con conclusion on on that side. Uh, and perhaps sorry, one thing I did skip over here is the 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 medium term impact of of electric vehicles. It's quite possible that we are completely underestimating. What where we could stand 10, 10 years from now, even eight, eight years from now. Uh, we are very close to a, a, almost like an inflection point in the cost and economics of electric vehicles. And electric vehicles will move from being a, a kind of a luxury, ex exotic type item to becoming the workhorse of our transport economy. And that is quite likely to happen in the next 10 years and will obviously have an enormous impact on 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 the liquid fuels industry and raises very important questions for us in terms of our medium to longer term policy framework. <laughs> then to move on to gas, so, uh, there are also, there's also a very important revolution that's happened that will in, in, in te technology that will impact the, the gas side of the equation. And that is that, uh, that's actually in the ele electricity industry. We've reached a point now where where, where renewable energy has taken over from coal as being the, the cheapest source of, of primary energy for the power sector. So in effect, renewables are now the new base load in terms of the economics of energy, simply energy. So in the past, um, you know, the term base load is, a, a, those of you who follow the debates in the power sector know it's a, quite an important and quite a controversial term. People get quite, up, quite worked up about the issue. But in the past, you know, we, demand has always been, you, know, you have a, a daily and a weekly and a monthly and a year, annual profile of demand. It's not flat. It changes all the, all the time as we speak. And the only reason we talk of base load is because that was the cheapest way to produce power. You run a, a, coal, a large coal station or a nuclear plant or even a large hydro plant. You build it and you run it flat out. And obviously then you're gonna have flat supply. So the reason why base load was important is because that was the easiest way to produce cheap energy. That's why it was important. Not because it met demand. Demand wasn't flat. Demand varied. So then we also needed to make sure that we had plant on the system that could meet the delta, the difference between demand and, and the base load. Right. So what's happened now is renewables have taken over that role. And now provides the cheapest, can now provide the cheapest energy in the system. And again, there will be a mismatch between demand and supply. It's just another delta. It's just another curve. And we need dispatchable, flexible power that can meet that difference when we need it. And that now, that power is more about capacity than it really is about energy. And that's the role of gas. Gas is now, gas to power is now the cheapest way of meeting the difference between our cheap base load energy and the actual demand on a half hourly, you know, or instantaneous basis. That's, and that's the important revolution that's happened 
that will now drive demand for, for gas power. So we all, those of you that follow the energy sector, the electricity sector, the debates knows that from the IRP modeling done by the government and also by the CSR, have identified that that is the key role for, for, for gas and that's why we need gas. Um, some of you might have read the article by Michael Liebrich from Bloomberg New Energy who refers to the firm spread. That's the value of um, having dispatchable power over the cheap base load power that, that, that will now be renewables. And that's, that's where gas will, will, fill the, will fill the gap. And if, if that is the case, obviously we come to the question, well, how are we going to get our gas? And given that we don't have an, a local resource, the, it, it again points to the question of building infrastructure. Either more pipeline infrastructure from neighboring countries, primarily Mozambique, or LNG import infrastructure. So those, in my mind, are the key drivers for, for, for the sector. Now turning to how we create an enabling environment for, for this infrastructure, whether it's um, liquid fuels, import and storage infrastructure throughout the, throughout the country, or whether it's gas import infrastructure. And um, so, so the, I mean, I'm just looking at two, I just thought of two key areas that we, we should talk about. And the one has already been touched on, and that is the regulatory and policy framework. I'm not going to talk about policy because some of that has already been addressed. I'll perhaps just talk a little bit about the challenges, the practical challenges of building and um, building this infrastructure that we need. If you want to build an LNG plant, you need to navigate at least uh, three or four regulatory regimes. I mean, you need to get environmental approvals. You need to deal with the ports regulatory regime. Uh, if you're building it for gas to power, then well, then you also need to deal with a gas regulator and get all the approvals, which is NERSA. And then you also need to deal with a power regulator, which is also NERSA, but they're completely separate legal framework and essentially a different set of people. And all of that has to align to make your project viable and bankable. And that creates a very high level of com complexity, given that this is new. This hasn't been done in our, in our country before. I think I'll, I'll leave that there because we are running out of time. But then the next question is, well, if, are the, if those are the kind of challenges, you know, we have um, all the normal risks to developing projects, and then you also have, have all these quite complex and new regulatory challenges in, this, in the South African environment, What's, um, what commercial structure or what you know, approach to developing these projects would, would, would make most sense? I, ideally, I guess one wants to separate the enabling infrastructure from the energy itself, from the owners of the energy. In other words, if you, um, you, you don't necessarily want, because often in, um, infrastructure is, uh, becomes a natural monopoly. So the infrastructure providers are in, in, in the end in a, in a monopoly position. But you actually still want to enable competition in the provision of energy. So ideally one wants to separate them, whether it's on the electricity system where you want to separate your wires from the providers of energy, whether it's um, in, in liquid fuels or gas or anywhere else. Now, th that is great in markets that are well established. So it is, we, we now see in South Africa merchant investors, new private sector investors that are building liquid fuel import terminals here in Cape Town Harbor, Bergen Cape, Cape terminals. They will not import fuel themselves. They are simply building a terminal and negotiating uh, agreements with importers and storage also with this, for this storage facility. And they're quite happy to do that. It's a well-established market. They understand the risks and it can be done. The same is true for the Sunrise Energy Project in Salt Saldana. Again, they will not be owning the LPG. They will not be importing it. They build the infrastructure and there's sufficient knowledge of the market for them to do that and then to sign up uh, medium term contracts with large scale aggregators and importers who will take that capacity risk on the basis of their trust and their own ability to be able to sell the product. So that model where you deintegrate the capacity providers from the energy players works in well established markets. The question is can it work for LNG for instance, LNG to, to power? Particularly in a, in a situation where you have um, 
this high level of complexity around the regulatory regime and it being a new sector and the demand side of the market not quite being well established and so forth. And that for me is, a, is actually an, an, an open question. The only gas importation project we have in the country, as you know, is the, is the Romco pipeline. It's a quite a large project. And essentially that was Sassel. So, I mean, what did we have there? We had a, a very large vertically integrated state, uh, which was a previously state, state monopoly, using all of its uh, market power and political clout to negotiate, to get two governments to negotiate an international agreement to enable, you know, a, a, a trans-border pipeline with all its risks, running deep into Mozambique, um, and put capital into the ground and build this project and have sufficient confidence in the ability to manage any unforeseen circumstances that will arise over the life of the project. So the question is, you know, what do we need for, for the gas to power framework? Do, should we impose a, a kind of a, I mean, a, a kind of a model where we deintegrate the energy from the infrastructure or is it actually should we start off by allowing the private sector to come and build their own vertical, vertical integrated project and sell power and sell gas on the side? That is, I think that's an important question for me. Um, a last, a last, perhaps further, a last further point is, given this level of complexity and risk, it's ultimately the viability of any type of infrastructure project like this lies in, in the market. It lies in the demand side. And it's really important to not think about policy from a supply side point of view, but to start at the demand. And, um, and the problem with this sector is that we don't quite yet understand the demand side very well. So it doesn't make sense for government to nominate that they want to have the project in Richards Bay in Kucha and, and say not until Saldana, for instance, is, is not the first priority right now. Or does it, would it be better to say, look, we want, we need this much capacity on the system. Let's see, let's, let, let's see what, what, what the market can, up, can come up with. Let's see where people are prepared to take the risk and how they can, how, you know, how they can best um, put together the demand side to, to make the project viable and bankable. Thank you, that's my last comment. Great, thank you, Crevet. Um, as you will appreciate, we've run well over our expected time from the panel. Um, so I'd like to get involved in the conversation as, as quickly as possible. Um, and for those of you who are still sitting on our dialing system, you have the opportunity, obviously, to field questions by text. We will see them here, and we will float them with the audience here as well. But be aware that any questions that we don't get around to answering this evening, which you have lodged by text, will be answered as part of the, of the final summary of these proceedings. And there will be a report issued as part of this conversation, which will be distributed to everyone who has registered, either in person or remotely via the webinar. So we've heard a diversity of perspectives, strong focus on the supply challenges and opportunities, uh, laterally uh, an, an understanding that you know, if we looked at things from a demand perspective, we might, that might pose a different set of lenses for us. Um, we've seen and heard, in fact, that global consumption of diesel is under threat. And you only have to reflect, well, how did that happen? That was a consequence of certain car manufacturers uh, tweaking the emission tests. So it was, it was a consumer resistance that has led to this position in global diesel flow. And that happened as quickly as you can snap your fingers. So if, if there is that power vested in the demand side of this equation, surely that's got to be considered and factored into any medium to longer term analysis of the sector. So without further ado, you've, you've seen the questions that were posed by way of invitation to this, and Steph reiterated them from the perspective of IKME. But I'd like to throw it open to conversation from the floor. Uh, we have a couple of roving mics and some very able postgraduate students who are going to run around quickly. So without further ado, it's over to you. Philip, you have the first question. Uh, I've got two uh, contributions, really. The first is regarding electric uh, cars. Uh, at the moment, uh, Britain's new car uh, uh, 
make up is 1.4%. Uh, there are six recharges for every car. Most of those recharges are fairly low power, about 20 kilowatts. Uh, what people tend to forget is that uh, the liquid fuels that we're currently using for recharging our cars are extremely high energy ones. When you pour half a litre a second of, of petrol into your car, uh, you're, put, you're turning on 20 megawatts of power. So to, to recharge your car at 20 kilowatts means you're taking 100 times more. What is happening in Britain already is there's quite a lot of recharge rage with people finding rechargers and then queuing for hours waiting for the things to go. So I don't think that electric cars are going to come in that quickly, partly for that reason, and also for the simple reason, the moment that you start looking at large volumes of electric cars, you look at uh, more or less doubling the size of ESCOM, and I don't think that's going to happen overnight. The other side of things is the fact that we should be having a debate that we're not having that really has been stimulated by Mr. Trump, and that is, is climate change real? Is that a real threat to us? I've been doing some arithmetic on that, uh, and the arithmetic suggests that cutting coal supplies to people, trying to cut down on the amount of energy you have, kills people. Kills people by the millions. And it's a very simple equation. If you use less than 500 kilograms of, of energy per year per person, then your life expectancy is below 50. If you use over 1,500 kilograms of oil equivalent per year, then your life expectancy is over 70. Don't cut energy. Go away carbon taxes. We don't need them. We need to debate that very urgently. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. That's a contentious set of propositions to put on the table as I'm set of opening remarks. But perhaps it just is reflective of the diversity of views that we're trying to capture here tonight. Um, so again, the floor is open. Harold. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I was interested, this is a question for, for Niall. Uh, sorry, I'm Harold Winkler from the Energy Research Center at UCT. Um, I was interested, you, you, you were talking about Norway and, and, and the sovereign, sovereign Fund, if I, if I understood you. Um, and I'm going to come to a question in a moment, but it struck me that in, in the drawing a parallel to renewables and electricity as provided, in, in, in that program, the REI4P program, there's a provision that you have to make a contribution, project developers have to make a contribution to socioeconomic development, and it's done in a particular way. So my question to you is, look, thinking about the future of oil and gas, whether, whether you're suggesting with, by raising the sovereign fund that oil and gas should, uh, the oil and gas sector uh, should pay a free carried interest and you raise the MPRDA to a, into a sovereign fund and, and what do you think the percentage should be? Thanks. So within uh, the, the navigating of the MPRDA, there was initially some discussion around 20% free carry to the state. That is now being modified to carry in the, in the proposed amendment, which has not yet been signed into law, which provides the opportunity for some of the investor's cost currently stated as at production but perhaps that would come in, into earlier cost as well, to be recovered in, in some mechanism to be developed. Now, I, I can't tell you what. I don't have a proposal or an answer on whether it should be half of that or 5% of that. And my comments are really driven by, as you look around the world, oil and gas can bring a lot of wealth. It doesn't in and of itself distribute that wealth well across the population Equitably, it doesn't necessarily distribute opportunity uh, well. And I think that now is the time to be thinking about what the policy instruments need to be to do that. And I, I've spent the last three days at um, something called Africa Oil and Power, which is all of the African countries are in the convention center right now, um, opening up their bidding rounds for Equatorial Guinea, South Sudan, and so on. And one of the things I did not know, I've just learned, was that in Ghana, they are in fact following this model and they have a heritage, they call it a heritage fund. Um, and I think this is something that we, we need to think about carefully because you, you see how 
when we have a bonanza of something, how easy it is to to simply fritter it away on um, you know whatever's attractive at the time. And there's no doubt there's there's all of these needs that South Africa has around education and health and you know I mean there's any number of things. Um, but I think it, it, it's a wise discussion to start having now that if there is in fact oil and gas, that there is a way to warehouse some of that to ensure there's a legacy for future generations. And, and I'm carefully saying that if there is oil and gas, because you know we don't know that yet. We know that there was oil in the Karoo, for example, whatever it was uh, when Sukor went put those holes in in the 60s, that, but they weren't looking, uh, and they found gas. Um, but right now, people think there's gas. There's a lot of um, momentum behind that. But the sense I often have is that policymakers look at that and they've mentally spent that money and allocated it in budgets already. Um, and, and I would like to just draw some caution around that until we have some exploration holes that go down into the ground, all the modeling in the world counts for nothing. We have to have empirical, relevant South African data and use the data on which to make decisions. Um, so I hope that's something of an answer, but um, I, I'm not braver enough to, to venture a percentage. I'd like it to be large, though. <laughs> Thank you, Niall. I'd like to be fair and take in some of the questions that have been posed by our webinar participants this evening. And I'd like to start with two that are focused on the state and role and opportunities of carbon capture and storage. And I'm going to ask Steph if he wouldn't mind addressing those. So those are questions from Siggy Drews and Rajashri Bagley. So it's basically, what is the state of CCS and why have we not talked about it as an effective mitigation strategy for the sector? Uh, what, for, the, for oil and gas? Okay, so um, uh, carbon capture and storage uh, is, a, is uh, one of the, the topic areas for the uh, ICME Energy Centre to look into. Um, and as we all know, um, there have been some uh, rather challenging issues for, for CCS. The, the, the hope was for, by this stage, rather large scale use of CCS to decarbonize point sources of CO2 emissions, particularly from coal-fired power stations. Um, but the technology has been rather stillborn, really. Um, and that's mainly because of cost. So uh, despite um, a lot of research going on into how to reduce the energy penalty of, of the, mainly the capture part of, um, of CCS, uh, we haven't really got very far. Um, and um, uh, governments around the world, particularly at the UK, have eventually pulled out of, of the funding of these projects. And the private sector uh, won't do this without a considerable investment from from um, from government. So we're sort of at a, uh, an impasse. There are some projects, a few, um, but these are all tied to with um, in, enhanced oil recovery to to provide the economics of making it worthwhile. And, and then you have this conundrum where you're using carbon capture to remove CO2 uh, from power stations. Uh, to produce more oil for use in transport, which then gives you more CO2. So you have this um, strange dichotomy. So um, uh, we haven't really talked about, and that's mainly from coal, of course. Um, uh, you can use it for gas-fired power stations, um, and, uh, and, and there the efficiency is a bit higher because of, of cleaner um, uh, flue gases. Uh, it's, it's, it's not. It's easy. It's it's well known how to capture CO2, but it's just difficult from very dirty flue gas, which is typical from from coal-fired power stations. So it's not something that we normally would consider with oil, um, but of course it is part of the of the um, considerations for 
for for decarbonize, decarbonization of the f of fossil fuels. Um, uh, my own view is is that uh, we've rather missed the boat with CCS actually, and and that it's probably um, too late now to to think of it as a serious um, carbon mitigation technology. Um, probably 40 years too late. So uh, I think it's actually been rather distraction uh, for us. Um, so uh, and uh, it, my view is that in the future of CCS is rather smaller scale than the kind of predictions that we see in the IEA um, roadmaps. Um, uh, th there will be various point sources where it could be economical but I think we, we really need to move um, into other forms of decarbonisation such as the electric vehicles or um, the, the use of gas as a transition fuel. And if I may just add to that, I think it's important to reflect on the whole fuel life cycle and where the CO2 emissions are coming from. It's very easy to look at carbon capture and storage from point source emissions. So from the refineries themselves or from the Sasol, coal to liquids plants, etc. It's a damn sight harder to do that when you're looking at tailpipe emissions from a car's exhaust or a truck's exhaust. Um, and in South Africa, and forgive me if I've got these numbers kind of wrong, Harold may be able to help me. The transport sector collectively is the second biggest CO2 contributor to the country's footprint. Andrew, you're shaking your head. 10% in total. And could you, sorry. Could you, could you tell us what percentage of that is from fuel production versus fuel use? No, that's all just from, that's from the tailpipe. That's from the tailpipe, yeah. yeah. So fuel production, uh, I mean, there's a marginal amount from refineries, but it's primarily Sassel. So in other words, the, the Sassel, Sassel is what makes our, our, whole, our whole liquid fuel supply sector so massively carbon intensive. Without Sassel, it would, it would be quite a small percentage of our, so I think was, I think Sassel is, so that's about 48 in 2010 and I think the transport sector was about 48 megatons or something of CO2, but Sassel's secunda is around 60, yeah. perhaps slightly more. So the, and the refineries I think are less than 10, uh, depending on where they, you know, which ones and where the fuel comes from, but they're not you know, it's many, Sassel is the anomaly that, that you know. Yeah. yeah, and it's it's interesting, again, just to keep on this, um, this platform about talking about integrated energy planning and policy. We have scenarios that are being advocated by the National Department of Energy uh, that invoke the building of more coal to liquids plants up to 2035 and up to 2050 under certain conditions. And given what we've just heard about the carbon footprint of coal to liquids, you've got to ask whether that makes any sense in terms of this bigger picture of sustainable transport fuels going forward. Anthony, and then Brett, and Philip perhaps again. Thanks, Jim. <clears throat> um, we've been talking about the decarbonization of transport but one of the transport modes that we haven't actually covered is, is air transport. And that is one that is going to be extremely difficult to decarbonize unless we can go to, to uh, bio, <clears throat> biofuel use and XTLs, clean you know, uh, gas to liquid fuels, for example, would be an, an exam, um, a fuel that could be used in those, those circumstances. And that's where I think CCS carbon capture and storage is going to be essential given the CO2 footprint of XTL type uh, approaches to fuel production. Um, I'm, I'm curious to know <coughs> from you, Steph, um, what the price per ton that you're talking about because there have been some recent quite significant breakthroughs in maybe maybe not you know shooting the lights out but the recent breakthroughs by Carbon Clean Solutions Bringing, bringing it down to 30 tons per um, 30 dollars per ton, which is half of the DO, US DOE's target of 60 dollars a ton, and they claim that they will be able to reduce that even further to about 30 dollars a ton. So, <clears throat> just you know, the, the uh, trans, um, air transport is is an issue for me. Uh, 
Uh, yes, certainly. Um, uh, we we haven't talked about air, air transport today, and I, and I was thinking about that this morning in terms of what uh, the kind of splits are for for oil in terms of of um, uh, the, the uses. Um, um, gasoline, of course, is is by far the the biggest. Aviation is only a, it's a small amount, but of course, um, uh, air travel is increasing, in the, and it's a and it's a it's a, it is a big problem. Um, so. Yes, yeah, so this is what I meant about CCS actually having rather more limited um, deployment uh, uh, because of the, I think the large scale point sources, I think it's, it's problematic. Um, uh, I wasn't aware of, of the, the report you've just, uh, the study you just told me about um, and uh, uh, certainly that's obviously starting to become quite, quite interesting but of course, um, you know, coal Coal price has gone down as much as, much as oil price has, has gone down, and, and um, it's it's extremely cheap to produce um, uh, in, energy from coal, uh, for electricity from coal, um, which does make it problematic when you're going to stick a stick a carbon capture and storage facility on top of existing um, power stations. Um, you know, when you think of the, the power stations in, in the Tro Valley in Australia, for instance, how how cheap that coal is to to dig, dig out of the ground. It's very close to the surface, and um, huge CO2 emissions from that. And and it just would not be economic to to have carbon capture on that. So you're better off closing the power station. Um, but targeted at, at production of aviation fuels, for instance, that that might make sense. Sorry, if if I may just come in on that very quickly. The, the coal-fired power generation economics in this country are substantially different to the Latrobe Valley. Uh, the levelized cost of these new big coal-fired power plants is roughly double what we're seeing coming in through the renewable energy space. So I think it's important to reflect on that as well. Niall, did you have a, a, a comment? Uh, or was well, it it's more a question than a comment. You know, and it's about this assertion earlier on about the big shift being to electric vehicles in, in, in transport. But in the South African context, if your driver is environmental emissions and so on, the simple reality is that 90% of our electricity is coming from coal anyway, so you're getting a coal-fired car. If you hold on. Uh, Brett, you had a question. I think it's linked to all of these, the, the, the debate that's going on here, but my, my question is really to any of the panelists, given what we've heard about sort of the economics around crude oil refineries, and uh, the, the, certainly I don't think we'll get a new CCL refinery, d does anybody see the likelihood of us building new GTL facilities in South Africa to, produce, to provide liquid fuels if there is going to be a growing demand in liquid fuels? And certainly that has a much better common performance than Cecil and, and from what I understand as well, refinery fuels. I don't know what the economics are of, of GTL. Okay, um, can I just get a show of hands? Who wants to respond to that specific question? And who has other questions? All right, so um, Ian, please, first. Just speak rather loudly. Just speak rather loudly, okay. Um, GTL is three times the price of oil refinery and half the price of CTL. So you're talking around ninety to hundred thousand dollars a barrel of daily capacity. Extremely capital intensive. If you've got free gas, it might be an option. If you're in Qatar, it might be an option. If you wish to invest, it might be an option. Um, but if we, everyone thought that when you put up Sasol, you're going to get cheap petrol because the price of coal is very low, but the product it makes is still internationally traded. So whether or not GTL is going to produce a cheap product is a fallacy. Um, and it's just tying up capital that could probably be used better elsewhere. There are other routes for monetizing gas that might be more effective. Um, I think we've seen flattening oil demand, plenty of oil out there, plenty of finished product out there. Um, it's probably not a good use of uh, local capital to do that, a view. Okay, Eric, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, first, a comment about the GTL plant. Uh, we have an underutilized GTL plant in Mossel Bay, so uh, there's spare capacity. Uh, a point on the uh, carbon capture technology. 
you need to distinguish between the carbon capture technology for power station and for a CTL or a GTL type of plant. In the CTL or GTL type plant, yeah, carbon capture should be relatively cheap because the CO2 is very pure. You can just compress it, so it's, just, it's a compression cost. Yeah. Uh, what I'm missing tonight is a bit, and the last panel speaker spoke about this, is what is the projected demand? What do we need in South Africa? And how are we going to supply that need with the variety of sources we have? We have coal, we have oil, we have natural gas, yeah, and each of them can supply to a certain extent the demand, but not fully. So we need to understand what the demand is going to be, or targeted demand, yeah, in order to then say for what kind of mix we would need to have our gas, oil, and other sources. And that's what I find a bit missing tonight. Sorry. Okay, I am mindful of time, but I know there's quite a few questions still keen to be asked. Can I just make a, a, a proposal? That given we start at 10 minutes late, we'll stop at 10 past 7. All right. So, Dave, you have a response to Eric, and then I'd like to field some more questions, uh, both from the floor and from our webinar speakers. Eric, your point is right. The market should drive everything, and that's why we should have a proper IEP. If the IEP was done properly, we would have a much better idea of where things were going. Um, but I think that that given that demand is so uncertain, the important thing we have to do is address it in small chunks rather than in big chunks. So building massive uh, power stations rather than putting up multiple uh, renewable energy projects is, is not the way to go. Don't go for the big jump, go for the small steps. And I think we should be doing that with everything. Okay, I, I'd like to hear from people who haven't yet had a chance to speak. Uh, Jim, if I may come in with a couple of comments. There was a question about gas to liquids in South Africa. I think the key question is the gas supply. LNG will be far too expensive for us to consider as a feedstock. And the first projections we've seen for shale gas are also far too expensive to consider for GTL. If we're wrong and we do have gas supply, costs quoted by our independent specialists are right at the moment. They come from very high oil price driving costs up. Our understanding is that as the industry cools off, so do the costs for construction. So if we have lower costs for construction, which will continue to drop with the current low oil price, and we have a gas supply that we can afford, there is a future for GTL in South Africa. But for the moment, those conditions don't exist. So sh in short term, no. Maybe long term, possible. Okay, I'd, I'd like to take one more question from a webinar registrants this evening. And it's actually not a question, but a comment that's been offered by the head of the uh, Cape Peninsula University Technology ChemEng program, suggesting that they're going to launch an undergraduate program in petroleum engineering in the next two years, um, which, as I understand, will be the first in the country. Um, so one should be encouraged by that. It's a bold move to make because it's presumably predicated on some understanding of A, the skill shortage, but B, the opportunity that's going to be afforded graduates from such a program. So I flag it here for you just to bear that in mind. And those of you who are active within the sector, I would encourage you to make contact with the CPUT people to see to what extent you can add a contribution that will support them in those endeavors. Just hold on, Gareth, if you don't mind. Um, Niall, you had your hand up again? All good? Okay. I'm, I'm coming to you, Philip, but I am surprised that we haven't heard more of a strong voice about the climate change imperative, the environmental performance of the sector as a whole, 
um, and what the ramifications of our, let's not call it apathy, but let's call it a, a level of disengagement, what that might do for the regional performance of the sector and if we envision, envision a low carbon future going forward, what the implications are then for the sector uh, more broadly. And I'd love to hear someone have a go at that from the floor. You'll have a go. Excellent. There's one behind you. Uh, Robert Stewart speaking. Uh, when we're looking at uh, fossil fuels, there's a spectrum, uh, starting with coal, and I was glad that Dave Wright mentioned the coal in this context, all the way through to uh, um, LNG. Coal is dirty, the LNG is far cleaner. So where we should actually be moving, uh, and, and on the oil, let's talk about uh, Canadian tar sands. They're dirty. So we should be looking in uh, the use of our resources to move away from the, the dirty uh, fossil fuels to the clean. Now even in terms of oil refining, that means that we should be uh, moving towards um, light and less sulfurous feedstock. That's the, that, that, that's the point I want to make. Just uh, let's move away from coal and heavy uh, residue containing crude oils to relatively clean end of that spectrum. I'm going to ask someone from the refining sector to have a produce a response to that, whether that opportunity is consistent with the way we operate our existing refineries. Um, Bob has insight to crude, crude, the price of crude. What he's saying is not wrong, but that comes at a cost. Uh, we can migrate from um, tar sands or Venezuelan crude all the way through to condensates out of the North Sea. All that changes is the price. The market is extremely efficient. The suppliers are out there. Um, it moves up and down on a daily basis, as we have seen. Um, if there is a price built into emissions or CO2 emissions or SO2 emissions or management or the cost of hydrogen to upgrade those into better quality liquid fuels, it's priced into the refiners, it's priced into the, the marketplace. Um, there is always a price at which you can sell a rubbish crude. There is always a price that a consumer will stop buying a good quality crude. So left to its own devices, it will sort itself out and unless someone intervenes to mandate a difference, uh, then we're going to get um, what the market delivers, I think. If we penalize those, uh, those uh, heavy crudes, then the price will, then, then we will be incentivized towards the light ones. Philip, I'm, I'm, I'm questioning. Am I going to give you the last voice of the evening or not? I was very interested in the carbon capture and storage story that nobody made any reference whatsoever to the South African Carbon Capture and Storage Center being run by Senedi. Uh, and it suffers from the problem that uh, trying to find underground space in South Africa is very difficult. Uh, they are actually exploring two, two sites in South Africa right now, um, but um, we are very different, definitely short of underground space in which to put any, any captured CO2. Thank you. Thank you for that. And it simply reinforces, I think, the comments that Steph has been making about CCS. Um, I'm going to leave definitely the last word for Harrow to wrap up, but I would like to conduct a straw poll, if you'll indulge me. I'd like a show of hands of those who think South Africa should build another crude oil refinery. Okay, for those of you on the webinar side, that's one hand out of, out of our total assembled audience here. Right. Oh. 
You mean you've got an answer for that as well? <laughs> Please do. Okay, we had two uh, earlier speakers. Um, one said that there's no case for an oil refinery, and he meant an economic case. The other person said that uh, oil refineries are really just an essential uh, piece of equipment to monetize crude, and that's correct. That, that is correct. But uh, refineries are not built to get economic return, typically, not nowadays anyway. They're built for strategic reasons. Now, if we don't, if, if, if the one speaker said, let's just depend on the surplus of uh, finished products that are available in the market. Most of those, most of that surplus is actually, by design, residing in the in the Middle East. Now, I would not want South Africa to be dependent on clean production from the Middle East, finished product products from the Middle East. So that's why I think we should have at least an agreed high percentage of our uh, demand from our own refineries. It's an interesting view because in my, from my perspective, I don't believe in South Africa's energy planning processes there are overt considerations of geopolitical dimensions to anything. Um, yes. So with that, we did say we would go for two hours. We did start 10 minutes late, but I would like to hand back to Professor von Blotnitz and to thank you personally for your considered attention and contribution. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for your contributions. Um, the future of oil and gas, I think, and I've been typing notes all along, uh, is very uncertain in the global space, uh, that uncertainty for us. Uh, in South Africa and Southern Africa plays out in different ways. Um, it's very good to have that discussion here at the university um, because uh, what, what we have to do is to teach the next generation of engineers not the answers but the ways to think about getting to answers in that uncertainty. So I want to thank all of those who made contributions to that, uh, that you came out uh, either in person here or uh, online to, to share your views, your wisdom, uh, and for us to get that. We'll deliberate on that with the colleagues who are here, um, and we'll, we'll thread that into the teaching that we do. For myself, that means tomorrow, first thing up, uh, I think in this venue, or one down, with the fourth year class on what climate change means for the profession, and with the uh, pleasure of having our visiting scholar Prof. Simons to, to spend an hour with, with our fourth year class on, on exactly that question as well. And I'm sure he's taken a bit more out of this evening as well to take back into the international space. Uh, so uh, that's also our honor to contribute to the, the, that global discussion. So thank you very much, everybody. We've got some catering next door, but Jim may want to say it's, something about the details there. Uh, two things, really. By way of conclusion, the Institution of Chemical Engineers, as I said, started this global conversation. This will feed into that for sure. So there will be a summary report. And for those of you still listening on in the webinar, those of you whose questions we were not able to answer here during the session, they will be answered as part of that report. Um, so I would encourage you to uh, keep tabs on the iChemi website and follow that conversation as it moves forward. And Definitely the last point this evening is we would like you to stick around if you've got the time, come and share some refreshments with us in the venue directly across the, the corridor here. And thank you once again. Take care.